This screencast covers supplementary material for AP Physics C. It specifically covers neutron stars and pulsars in the unit on rotations. Okay, what's being depicted here on this opening slide is an extremely high mass star right before the end of its life. Right before the end of its life, however, a high mass star basically undergoes an alternating pattern of the following. You begin, for example, with hydrogen fusion in the core, which produces helium. Eventually, the hydrogen fusion, however, runs out because the fuel runs out, and then the star begins to undergo gravitational collapse. As it collapses upon itself, it heats up the helium that is present in the core of the star, so that it can fuse into heavier elements, carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen, and so on. And so this alternating pattern of gravitational collapse and subsequent nuclear fusion continues all the way up to about iron on the periodic table. Iron in particular consists of an extremely stable atomic nucleus, and it does not undergo nuclear fusion. So right before the star reaches the end of its life, you end up with kind of like this onion-like layer structure, if you will, of the star in the following way. You start, for example, with the lightest elements out here in the outer atmosphere of the star, hydrogen. Underneath that is helium. Underneath that is carbon, and so on and so on, all the way down to the iron and also nickel. It turns out the iron-nickel core. Because iron is resistant to fusion, this then, reach, this then means that the star reaches the end of its life and it undergoes final gravitational collapse. Okay, the time of the sequence of events, right when the star reaches the end of its life, particularly for extremely high mass stars, such as stars that are greater than 25 solar masses, well, the sequence of events are increasingly shorter in duration. So carbon fusion, for example, only lasts for about 600 years, neon fusion for about a year, oxygen fusion for about six months, silicon fusion for just a day, and then you end up with the inert iron core, and then the star undergoes final gravitational collapse. Okay, so when the star undergoes final gravitational collapse, the infalling layers of the star's outer atmosphere basically compress the core. If the star is massive enough, it will actually compress the core down to a singularity, which literally has zero size. So then therefore you end up with a point in space that has a finite mass and zero size, that is then what is known as black hole. However, for stars that are a little bit less massive, as the core collapse occurs, basically electrons are more or less switched into protons, resulting in neutrons. And then you end up with basically an enormous atomic nucleus consisting of neutrons, and it's stable. This particular object, called a neutron star, is only about the size of a city, but it has a mass that is several times the mass of the sun. While all this is happening, which happens very quickly, by the way, basically the infalling layers of the star's outer atmosphere, well, they rebound off the compressed core. When this happens, an enormous amount of energy is released in an explosion called supernova explosion. During the supernova explosion, the heat that is generated in such an explosion is hot enough to basically synthesize all of the heavier elements on the periodic table, that is, heavier than iron. And then all this material basically gets spewed out into the interstellar medium to get mixed into the interstellar medium and become part of the next generation of stars. Okay, while this process is occurring, the supernova explosion and the core collapse that's occurring, an enormous amount of energy is also released as what are called gravitational waves. Now, how can gravity be a wave? Well, we'll see that a little bit later on this year, but the energy release as gravitational waves is enormous. Gravitational waves are ripples in the fabric of space-time. Okay, now the last supernova explosion that was relatively close by and, and visible to the naked eye actually took place in the Large Magellanic Cloud, which, if you recall, is one of the dwarf irregular galaxies that is near the Milky Way galaxy. Okay, the Large Magellanic Cloud is about 150,000 or so light years away. And back in 1987, there was a supernova explosion that occurred in the LMC, and it was visible to the naked eye. Okay, here's a nice example of a supernova explosion that took place relatively recently in a nearby galaxy. For a few weeks, because of the energy that is being released during the supernova explosion itself, the supernova will actually outshine the rest of the galaxy's stars combined. So right here is basically a single star undergoing a supernova explosion, compare its brightness compared to all of these stars, for example, all of this fuzz that you see right here, making up the rest of the spiral arms 
of this particular galaxy. Okay, 10 years after supernova 1987A exploded in the Large Magellanic Cloud, the expanding material from the explosion actually slammed into some debris that was basically expelled off of the star during an earlier portion of its life stage, resulting in these glowing rings of material. The energy of the supernova is heating this material, causing it to glow. Okay, here's a nice little graphic depicting more or less the relative size of a neutron star compared to, say, the Grand Canyon. This particular scene is impossible, by the way, due to the enormous gravitational field associated with the neutron star. Basically, what would happen almost instantly is that the Earth itself would form a single layer of atoms at the surface of the neutron star. Now, a similar object called a quark star, quarks are the inner constituents of protons and neutrons, has been hypothesized but it has never been observed in nature. So far, we only know of neutron stars and then the ultimate case of what happens with gravitational core collapse, that is a black hole. Okay, here's a nice uh, picture of a relatively recent supernova explosion that took place in the year 1054. This is the very famous Crab Nebula. It was documented by a number of different cultures around the world at that time, Europe, also in America, and so forth. Ever since the explosion occurred, just over a or just around a thousand years ago or so, basically we have all this debris that is expanding outwards, and then all this debris right here will get mixed into the interstellar medium to begin to form the next generation of stars and planets and so on. Here's a nice little uh, sequence of pictures, if you will, using different wavelengths of light depicting the dynamics of the interior of the Crab Nebula, basically the region of space very close, for example, to the neutron star. And even over the course of just a couple of days, you can see these dramatic changes in the structure of the material that is near the neutron star. The neutron star, as small as it is, still gives off a huge amount of energy, and it dramatically affects the environment near it. Okay, so now specifically in the unit on rotations, let's briefly cover what happens here with the spin of a neutron star. So right here is showing a simple graphic of a star when it is more or less in the main sequence portions of its lifetime before it reaches the end of its life and undergoes gravitational collapse. In the case of the sun, it takes the sun about a month, for example, to rotate on its axis, but much like a figure skater pulling his or her arms in, then ultimately when the star gets smaller in size, then the spin rate increases. In the case of neutron stars, when they are first formed, they can actually spin at frequencies of several hundred times per second. Sometimes the explosion, the supernova explosion itself, is asymmetrical, and then therefore the individual star actually reaches escape velocity from the entire galaxy, and it can be kicked out of the entire galaxy due to the supernova explosion. Okay, here's a nice graphic then depicting what is referred to as a pulsar. A pulsar is essentially the exact same thing as a neutron star, except it's rotating at an extremely high rate. And then you've got this really tight magnetic field right here. All the magnetic field lines are really close together. Right here in red is the rotational axis. And then near the magnetic poles, here and here, you end up with a huge beam of radiation coming from the magnetic poles of the neutron star. And then if we, here at the Earth, happen to lie in the path of this beam of radiation, then we would see that beam of radiation as a series of pulses, hence the term pulsar. Primarily, we see the beam of radiation in radio wavelengths. So here's a simple depiction of that. It's much like a lighthouse, for example. When you look at a lighthouse, you can only see the lighthouse beam when it sweeps over your location. We see the beam of radiation associated with the pulsar in this manner. And that's, of course, why it's referred to as pulsar. Okay, a neutron star's interior. All sorts of weird physics occurs in the cores of neutron stars. In this particular case, we have a neutron star that's more massive than the sun. But once again, it's about the size of a small city. The diameter is 12 miles. Okay, the neutron star material is extremely conductive in its interior. This then ultimately produces extremely strong magnetic fields. Now, if neutron stars weren't weird enough, there's an even weirder version of neutron stars with extremely powerful magnetic fields, and these particular objects are referred to as magnetars. A magnetar is basically an, ex is basically an extreme version of a neutron star with an extremely strong magnetic field. 
I, in particular, like the word magnetar. It's one of the cool names that astronomers come up with when they are trying to des describe all these weird objects. Here is a famous example of a magnetar that is literally on the other, size of, the other side of the Milky Way galaxy from us. It's about 50,000 light years away. Back in 2007, a star quake basically ripped through the crust of this magnetar, releasing a blast of high energy radiation in the form of gamma rays. The amount of radiation that was released by this incredible object was actually enough to directly affect the Earth, more than 50,000 light years away. There are eyewitness accounts of auroral flashes being seen in the Arctic that coincided exactly with the arrival of the gamma rays coming from this neutron star, and the gamma rays themselves actually fried the circuits of artificial satellites, communication satellites, for example, orbiting the Earth. So this incredible object, just about the size of a city, on the other side of the Milky Way galaxy, was able to directly affect the Earth. That's absolutely astonishing. So here is that magnetar's location here on the other side of the Milky Way. Here's the core of the galaxy, and then here's the location of the sun. This magnetar is 50,000 light years from us, and yet it could still directly affect the Earth. This object absolutely boggles the mind. Okay, now imagine a binary star system consisting of two neutron stars. Because these neutron stars lose a huge amount of energy as gravitational waves, they will then ultimately collide with each other. When they collide with each other, the collision results in the formation of a black hole. And also during the collision of neutron stars, this is where very heavy elements are forged on the periodic table and they're blown outwards into the interstellar medium. So we know of a couple of extreme mechanisms by which heavy elements can be synthesized on the periodic table. One method is the shock wave that moves outwards from a supernova explosion. A second, more exotic example is what happens when you have neutron stars that collide with each other. Basically, a huge amount of material spewed out into the interstellar medium as extremely heavy nuclei. So, neutron stars, just to kind of summarize, are absolutely bizarre objects. I really like the idea of a magnetar in particular. It's almost as if neutron stars weren't weird enough. There's like a weird cousin, if you will, of neutron stars called a magnetar. Personally, I think that magnetars are a little bit more interesting than black holes. Black holes are sort of simpler, if you will, in terms of their physics, in terms of what's going on with their formation and so forth. Whereas with neutron stars, you end up with all of these bizarre circumstances that surround them. Okay, that concludes the screencast covering neutron stars.